Phoenix here, guys. Good morning or good evening, rather, from Hong Kong here. Thanks for tuning in. It is another, well, what is this day really? Is it Groundhog Day? I sort of feel like that, that's what we, what we are living in at the moment. Uh, basically, every morning we wake up, bond yields are up, market is down, and then towards the end of the day, the things have turned around again, and we think everything is going to be wonderful the next day, and then press repeat. Uh, I think that, that's the film we are currently stuck in. Perhaps that's got something to do with COVID, that days are sort of all blending into one. I, I, I don't know what it is, but a uh, big welcome to you guys here on the chat. Uh, I see here, uh, Fatmi CH, uh, great to have you on the chat here, uh, SMP Andrew. Um, absolutely excited for this. Now, what are we talking about here today? Well, I think we should obviously do a little bit of a market roundup. Markets are open, see what's really going on here with bond yields and everything. I do want to talk about Palantir. I put that in the title. I'm excited about Palantir uh, and uh, I'm going to explain to you why and why I think that is such a fantastic growth opportunity and I think why the timing is actually good. Now, as always, remember guys, this is not financial advice. This is just for entertainment only uh, and I will make myself uh, small enough so you can see things I'm looking at, especially this sheep here. Isn't he fantastic? This is Stanley the sheep. He does all the hard work around here. Uh, look at him. Uh, chop. And now all you have to do if you want to support Stanley the sheep is press the like button, guys. I'll donate one cent for every one of your likes. As for all our videos. Now, uh, market is looking like this. Uh, this is really what it looked like yesterday. I could actually just press replay and play what we did yesterday. Um, but on a more serious note, so check. Stand off. Why? Because bond yields are up. I'm going to have a look at that in a second. Uh, and why does that happen? You might wonder. Philco here. Very good evening to you uh, uh, too. Uh, great to have you on the on the chat. Uh, Philco and CH Maximus here, part of our uh, uh, Patreon uh, and, and Discord community, guys. So if you want to get there, you want to get the news first and talk to us all day long. Uh, that's the place to do it. Link below. Now, what does the market look like? Well, basically, people are fleeing tech stuff things with growth, things with forward valuation, and they are going into things like financials, like banks here. Why? Well, banks benefit from higher interest rates. Why is that? Well, they'll lend you um, on the higher interest rate because that's what's coming down the road 10 years uh, down the line. So they charge you a high interest rate, but they are uh, paying the low current interest rate. It's more profitable for them. Also, JP Morgan, for example, gets more than 30 billion US dollars a year in, in income, interest income from bank deposits and Bank of America, uh, you know, right up there with that. So that's why these two uh, massive giants are up. Pretty much the whole sector is up. Um, Berkshire Hathaway is up. So this is part of this kind of shift from growth uh, and tech into more defensive value plays. And you'll see some of the other uh, value na names also. Uh, insurance is, is up. That's actually what Berkshire Hathaway really is. It's an insurance company. Um, you know, some of the uh, more defensive stocks are up. Uh, tobacco, for example, people fleeing into uh, dividend yields. Consumer defensive also looking pretty on the green side and Baba still isn't that marvelous. That never happens. And if you don't realize that I'm rather a fan of the Alibaba stock, uh, why is that? Because Hong Kong today uh, had a wonderful Alibaba day here up almost 5%. And, and again, why is that? Um, I'm digressing here slightly. I understand. I do ask other things if you want to. Um, it's because the antitrust investigation to Alibaba for once is helping Alibaba because their main rival, Tencent, who operate WeChat, which is an app that basically every single phone in China has on, and including me, otherwise you can't live here. Um, it's a fantastic app. It isn't just sort of a, a WhatsApp chat thing, but you have shops on there. Now, Alibaba with their Taobao uh, e-commerce business is, is apparently going to list on WeChat. So they're going to have Taobao deals on WeChat and therefore reaching a huge audience that they couldn't previously reach because Tencent was their sort of arch rival, the nemesis. And now because of the antitrust uh, it's, it's a story uh, that, that is happening. And Philco is saying, is Baba a defensive stock now? You know what? It should be. It's a value stock in the long run, but of course it does have its, its, its regulatory overhang. Uh, and now the EV sector here looking a little bit less, less appealing, right? Tesla, Neo down in the red. Now let's have a look at those guys. Uh, this is a live uh, Nasdaq ticker here. So these are, are sort of to the second. Well, it refreshes every eight seconds where we can press the button more often if you are so minded. Let's have a quick look at the winners here. Lukewong still recovering very nicely, that recovery. Uh, Sundial 
their earnings underwhelmed in terms of revenue, but it is still up. It is an interesting stock. I'll do some more coverage on that, guys, if you are so interested. Basically, I do the contrary you guys are most interested in. Uh, so do uh, shout out what you want me to talk about, and I will look at that. The volatility index is also up. Coupang recovering slightly here, but still uh, way, way off where they were from the IPO price. And if you watched my, my video on that pre-IPO, um, you will see uh, my views on Coupang. I'm a little bit bearish on Coupang, not because I think it's a bad business, but I think the valuation is, is lofty. And now X, Pang and Lee are up a little bit. That, it has me uh, hoping that this day might turn around as yesterday did. Now, why is this all happening? Why are they doing this to us again? Well, can you see this here? US 10 year uh, bond, bonds are up to 1.744. Yesterday, I think the peak was about 167, something like that. Um, so this is up 6% almost, and you can see all of the longer term bond yields are up as much as 10%. So, you know, we were saying yesterday after the uh, Fed was talking, and we did it this morning too, if you joined our morning life, life um, how clever the uh, power was to kind of convince us that he's broken with tradition and he's changed policy. They're no longer preemptively fighting inflation. They're going to wait for it to, to actually uh, appear. Well, I, I think all of that's gone out of the window. And that's a little bit what we've been seeing um, every single time he speaks. We get half a day rally and then it sort of all evaporates and then we're back where we started and actually actual faint faint fact usually in a worse place than we started now i do think we have to kind of give this a, a at least till after lunch till we judge this day because at the moment uh, we tend to have red mornings um like like we are, we are seeing here uh, and then better days actually so uh, there might be some improvement now what we're going to do is we're going to of course run through some of our key stocks we're going to look at what the charts look like we're going to see what's happening there are these good buying opportunities, perhaps? Um, and I'll, I'd like to talk about Palantir, if you don't mind, guys, because I do think uh, we are approaching a good buying opportunity there. Um, what are you guys uh, shouting out here? Um, um Indian Palantir, absolutely. We can get into that right. CCIV, what do you think? Um, I actually just uh, recorded before this a video on CCIV. I'm becoming rather bullish on CCIV, and that would surprise some of you. Uh, but I, 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 I think it is an interesting one. We should definitely uh, talk about that. Funny, she's saying, saying, saying the EV sector is coming back. My question is, where's the bottom? I'll be by even more as the sector falls. Um, I, uh, S and P, you're saying the jobless claims. Uh, what was the number out? Is it is it out already? I haven't seen it yet. Um, we can have a quick look if we can see that here in uh, in the news. Does it show it us here? Headlines for Neo. Okay, that's probably not quite the, the, the right one. Maybe on futures we might get it in here. Uh, Sterling, no, that's currencies. Uh, Bank of England respect, expects a rapid UK recovery soon. Uh, but I think they're also promising not to do anything about inflation. Uh, if, if, you, if you've got the numbers out there, shout them out. Uh, S&P 77,000 is the jobless claim. In my, in my opinion, under 25 is great for PLTR, ABJ. Okay, let's get to PLTR. That is what I advertised. We will talk, talk exactly about that. Now, um, let me get rid of a couple of these lines because otherwise it is hard to follow uh, my, my narrative. Now, what has PLTR done? Well, Palantir done. The CEO, uh, Alex, yesterday, he's basically, in my view, shaken the tree. And he's basically wanted to have the kind of, you know, the, the paper hands, as we now call them. He wanted them to fall out. He basically said, if you are short term in Palantir, get out, buy something else. If you are a speculator, if you're hoping for a quick buck, go and buy something else. We don't want you here in Palantir land. Uh, so go and buy another stock. And that led yesterday to Palantir being one of the very, very few tech stocks that actually sold off. You know, the market ended up all very nicely in the green. Palantir didn't. Palantir was down percent and a half or so, pretty much exactly where they are now. And I actually think it's a good move. I applaud him for that. I think he's making very clear, guys, here, I'm not playing this short-term quarter-on-quarter game where we have to deliver a certain thing uh, by the end of the quarter. So our earnings call is particularly exciting. That's not what we're interested in. We're interested in actually building a good long-term business here having the best software and delivering a long-term strategy there. Now, that's all a lot of words, but uh, that's, I think, kind of what he said there. Now, if you look at this chart here, right, uh, and I'm going to explain what this is at the bottom in a second because that is a little bit confusing, but I will explain it and why that's important. And uh, let me get rid of this line here too. You can see, basically, that our pattern... So this, this up here is our rally, right? Uh, this is our rally up here, right, that area. 
Uh, before that, we were zigzagging up around this area until we got to the rally. Now we've sold off. And where, where are we moving around? Do you, you get the point I'm trying to make? We are in exactly the same band. So we are exactly where we were pre-rally. Uh, what is the benefit of that, you might ask? If you bought up here, then it isn't very happy. Last time I bought Palantir was at $28, which was just me being overexcited because something sold off. Uh, don't do it. Don't buy a falling knife. Wait for it to consolidate. Uh, that would be, be my, my, my thought on that. And remember, not my advice. It just comes here from, uh, from Stanley, the sheep. Um, we are building some really, really fantastic support down here. We've got great support at uh, 22.50. That might seem quite low, but we do, you know, down here and then, you know, here again and then here again. Uh, we have great support at uh, about uh, the $24.20 20 or so mark. You can see that here where we touched that line. Uh, we did it again here where my mouse cursor is. Uh, you get the picture. We did it again there. Um, I think that's near near to it. And, and, you know, these are also fairly close. So fantastic support around that 24 line. And even if we do go below that at 20, 22.50, we are, in my view, at the moment, moving sideways in this area. And, and I think that is building fantastic consolidation. I like, I like stock zigzagging because it builds support. Now, uh, the exciting thing is that this indicator down here, uh, this uh, crazy little number of charts down here, I'm going to explain that. It's called a, um, a sort of momentum squeeze indicator. What do they actually call it? A Williams VIX fix. No, sorry, that's not it. A squeeze momentum indicator. And it's got nothing to do with short squeezes. So nothing to do with you know, Reddit or any of that stuff. Um, what it does is, let's go back one period um, here. When these little crosses, and they're quite faint, I appreciate that. You can see here they are gray, right? When they go black, it means it squeezes on. And that sounds like a pop song. Um, I'm not going to start singing, don't worry. And then they stay on and on and on. When they get released, depending on whether the bar is green or red, it, it, it predicts a sudden and very substantial explosive movement in one direction. If it's green, it goes up. If it's red, it goes down. So what happened here, and let me put a line in here so you can see what I'm looking at on the 22nd of January, um, it predicted, it released here, right? You can see it goes from black to gray. And what happened up here? We went up into the sky all the way to the moon. And then it went gray and gray and gray again. Now what's been happening? This squeeze is back on. It got released here uh, on, on that day. Let me put in another line here so you can see how this works. Now that is a sell-off line. So I'm going to make it red. And what happened to the stock uh, when that happened? Well, we got an explosive sell-off, right? We went down to about uh, $22 or so. So that is, is what happened there. It kicked us off. Now, then the squeeze was off again. It was gray, 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 gray. It's on again now. Is The crosses are black. I hope you're with me so far. Just think this man is mad. And it continues to be on. And look, you can see the faintest bit of little green up there. Uh, it is, I mean, almost for me, it's almost imperceptible. For you, you probably can't see it at all. But basically, you can see the red lines have disappeared, right? Now, that will, at one point, um, turn into a gray cross, at which point it squeezes it off, at which point we're going to either go up to the moon or, or, or fall down very significantly. Now, I don't like to predict what indicators are going to do in the future. So I'm going to watch this every single day. But my bet on this is uh, because uh, the way this looks is very similar to what the last pattern was. The last pattern was this here. And then here we got this explosive movement upwards. And now we have an even uh, stronger pattern like that. Uh, my bet is therefore that we are going to get up to that. Um, and that is just from a momentum point of view here. And I think we are basically, that's kind of how it typically works. You build a very solid support level and then people, everyone who wanted to sell is out of it and then it goes back up. That's typically what stocks do. Uh, that is my thought on this. So I do think that we are heading into a great buying opportunity on this. And that's just my perspective, guys. I'm not telling you to buy it. Um, now, it might fall a little bit lower because of all this nonsense with the bond yields. Absolutely. That'll hit uh, growth stocks like this a little bit. And, and, and I don't really mind that, to be honest with you. I think, I think it's a, an interesting buying opportunity. Now, if you look at our discounted cash flow model, which is on our Patreon here, which is what we're what looking at here, where I put all the good stuff. Well, no, no, I'm kidding. Uh, but uh, all the kind of charts and spreadsheets and, 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 and you know all that kind of stuff is all on here. Now, I have did a, a evaluation model here, which takes me to a fair value of 83.50. Uh, now, you're thinking, well, that isn't quite a 4 or 5x, is it? Uh, well, no, it isn't. But 
Uh, my growth numbers in here, I think are conservative. They're falling off every year. Uh, most analysts I've, in whose numbers I've seen uh, have us at about 12 billion or so by 2030. So if I change my 9,624 here to say 12 billion instead, uh, then that gets us up to 103. Now, the other thing I've done, because I am a conservative chap, uh, that I've down here put the um, EBITDA the margins, they go up and they improve in 2022, 2023, 2024. And then I put in, put in a couple of bad years. Why do I do that? I just sort of like to throw that in when I do these long-term predictions because we don't quite know what's going to happen. But why would a software company uh, have their margin fall by two thirds? It doesn't really make sense because you don't have huge capital expenditure typically for a software company, especially one as lean as Palantir. So if you improve those numbers also, you would actually get a bit higher. So my fair, fair, fair value at this range is 97 to $109. Uh, and, and I think there is actually room for that to go up. So that's a, a, a little bit my take here on Palantir, why I think this is a, I think it's a fantastic stock. I think it's undervalued. I think it's a little bit under the political cloud. Some people don't like it. And I think that's something perhaps to take into a, a account. Uh, that's something to think about um, how that might impact uh, the stock. And of course, you have to talk about, think about your own uh, feelings uh, regarding you know all the kind of ethics around it and all that sort of stuff but to me it's basically a fantastic AI big data company and uh, I, they're, they're only just getting into the commercial sector really um, the their steps into the automotive industry for example I think it's a fantastic one anything with a complex supply chain anything with lots of data anything with lots of customers they can all make a lot more money if they, if they buy Palantir. And that's really what I look for in businesses. What is the service they provide? Do they add value to their customers above what the cost is or are they just a sort of necessary evil? And so I, I think here, uh, these guys are providing an incredible service to, to companies. Um, uh, right, guys, if you have any questions, if um, you, you make me excited about Palantir, you feel well. It, Calm down and make sure you do your own research. Make sure you look at this calmly yourself. Uh, and and, and you know, we are not necessarily at the very dip of this market. Uh, you know, every day is another opportunity for bond yields to go up. Uh, and they say continue to do so. And, you know, they might go up to, um, you know, two or something like that. At the moment, they're 1.75. Um, they could go up some more. I, I, I think they, they might well hit uh, uh, over two, in which case tech sector is going to have a little bit of a tough time in the next couple of weeks. I think we're going to see some serious volatility, which if one, as I am, I buy stocks for the very long run, I think it's, it's, a, it's a great shopping opportunity, quite frankly, uh, because in a year's time or five years time, we certainly will have forgotten about these weeks and we won't be uh, worried about whether the uh, US uh, Treasury yield is at 1.74 or at, at, at 1.67. It doesn't really matter in the long run, but at the moment it does. So the, ma the markets there move. Um, so um, have you seen a BlackBerry's ER date announcement? Felix uh, says, Philco, no, I have not. Uh, what has BlackBerry announced? Uh, when is when are they um, uh, doing the earnings release? Uh, have you seen it, uh, Philco? Uh, share, please do. Uh, Baxby, does the uh, minus 35 PE concern you? Um, you're talking about Palantir here. Um, not really. Um, let me let's have a quick look at Finbox. See what the next numbers are. Uh, Palantir. So if we look here at uh, duh, 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 what's our market cap beta, okay, hang on, financials, no, that's income statement, uh, it should be on the overview of somewhere, right? Otherwise, we have to ask Google. Sometimes Google is the easiest place to ask for these things, isn't it? When you're looking for a basic number, like a, a price earnings um, number on here. Where is it? Value. Yeah, that's probably where it is. It is. Minus 38 it is, in fact. Um, no, it doesn't because it's negative because they haven't made a profit yet. It, it's as simple as that. It's a software company. I, I, I think you haven't got massive capex. Um, they are hiring a, a sales team, which quite frankly, I think is sensible spend because they haven't had one really so far. Um, they are tapping into IBM's 2,600 sales staff, which I think is a big boon. Uh, it, is sometime, it takes a little bit of time, of course, for people to get converted and really sign on and start spending more and more money. Uh, but you know, I, I think that's a positive. Um, it, it, you know, it's, it's simply negative. If it was you know, in five years time and it was um, you know, 3,000 or something like that, then that would worry me. But no, at the moment, it is negative. So I think PE ratios that are negative are just simply not really, really worth looking at because what do they tell you? They just tell you they made a loss. They don't really value the company because no one really values a growth company on the amount of loss 
they made at that stage. If they're making a loss in 10 years' time, different story. But at the moment, I, I don't think it, it matters particularly. Uh, what about the volume on Palantir, Matteo? Okay, let's look at that. I actually had the volume ch charts off here, guys, right? Because there were so many things going on here, I thought it might make it a little bit easier. So if you look at volume, see if we can, wow, I'm painting. Uh, I wanted to move this up a little bit. So what we had in here before, okay, let me get rid of a couple of my arrows. I make very big arrows when I get very excited. I apologize for that. So we had um, volume declining here while the stock up here was going up, right? That's what we painted that in, which isn't good. Uh, and that, of course, predicted the sell-off that we, we are on uh, now. Uh, now we are on a, on a sell-off trajectory uh, and our volume is fairly flat. Yesterday was 77 million, the day before it was 73 million. Not a huge difference. It would be nicer, of course, if you have less volume on sell-off days. Uh, that's just sort of a, a, a big rule of thumb. In a rally, you want your volumes to increase. When it slows down, be careful, you're, you're, you're nearing the peak. Uh, on a sell-off, you want your volumes to decrease because, um, well, then you are, you know, heading towards the, the market uh, bottoming out here. So thanks very much for that question there. Uh, Dan has to say, great interview with Alex Carp on CNBC two days ago. He basically said, we're here for the long run. If you are here for the short term, uh, go shop elsewhere. And Dan has, I mean, absolutely. And I agree with him on that. But, excuse me, I've got cat fur on my nose. That's why I keep touching my nose. Um, rather itchy. Uh, Ryan is my concern with the variation is the 35 revenue multiple on terminal value. Most uh, of your uh, DCF value comes the tell me value in 35 revenue implies a much higher PE, Ryan. Yes, I, I think you're right there. I think valuations, um, I think people haven't quite realized yet the power of big data, the power of AI, and how much more money you can make out of big data. And it's one of the few items of software that you can buy that will actually make you money. Now, we all pay for an operating system for Word or for Office or you know whatever it is, Mac software, and it costs us money. It doesn't really make us money. There's utility in it, yes, but it doesn't make us money specifically. And a sort of a simple example I like to give is, you know, when I go into a shop and I bought this shirt, say, um, they've never messaged me again since. Uh, they have my data. Uh, if they, there are some shops that do message me and they say spring sale. And that's all they do. They have my data. They know what I bought. They know what size I am. They know how much I spent. They know how often I go there. And some of these shops track you around the world, right? They have your data. Did they use it? No, because they haven't got a software to do it. If they did, they could message me and say, uh, Mr. Felix, that blue shirt you bought and that you are presently wearing on YouTube, I saw it. Um, we now have that in a, in a, in a shade of different blue and it has these cuffs and it's just in and for you there is a 10% discount shall I hold it for you uh, hit the one button on your phone and you could do that and uh, then you press one and it says uh, uh, do you want to pay for it right now we have your payment services uh, you know uh, saved you go yes okay it'll be delivered in two hours if they did that I would buy more right very very simple and that's a really, really simple example of just using it on a sort of very simple sales business. Retail is a fairly simple business. But if you then take into account and you link it to um, their back end, where well, they've got an inventory, right? So as a, as, a, as a garment company, for example, they've got inventory. They know what sizes they have, what sizes they've got too much of, what they've got too little of. Well, the sizes they've got too much of, they could message just those customers, for example, and they would therefore have an efficiency that means at the end of the season, they haven't got any wastage in their collection. And that's just a really simple example from a relatively simple business. Uh, if you then uh, apply that to say the in automotive sector where you know you have uh, 500 suppliers with you know 12,000 parts or something like that, imagine that the complications of that. If you could manage that better, you could save money on deliveries, on time, on payment terms, and all of that can be done by AI. Uh, I think it is one of the very few pieces of software I've seen that actually makes companies a lot more money than it costs. So for that reason, I'm particularly excited by this, and I haven't really seen a proper competitor for it yet. Um, that also has me rather excited. So. Um, uh, young and investing here is a spammer, guys. I am going to um, hide this user. Can I do that? Yes, isn't that, isn't that nice? Yeah, I've got some power here. Uh, she is hidden. Um, what do you see as the long-term viability of SPACs, given the short directed on them and the currently, even the post-consummation -con companies are being targeted to CH there? Look, I think once a SPAC merges, uh, and let, let me just put on the stock screen here so we can see live what's going on in the market. Um, once it merges and it becomes a proper business, I think the SPAC is kind of forgiven and forgotten. And that's kind of where I'm getting to with CCIV. I actually, I'm very excited about Lucid. Um, 
I do think the SPAC sector as a whole will disappear. And that might not be in three months or six months, but I think it is something that will disappear and will be talked about as the, you know, 2021 um, height of the market kind of kind of kind of madness. I just don't think it is a a long term sustainable model. Now, backdoor listings are. So, uh, you know, we have those here in Hong Kong as well. So if you're using a SPAC simply as a tool to list, but there isn't any speculation, the company is simply valued at the cash and then they merge and then it's great. But this kind of madness we see pre-merger at the moment where people are, you know, frothingly, uh, frantically talking up stock prices in, in, into, into, the, in, into the sky. And uh, if you look at, um, you know, CCIV, for example, you know, that kind of thing. I, I think that will eventually disappear because I think people will learn the lesson from it, you know, that you, you end up, uh, what's the percentage on that? You know, 600% or something we went up. And I think that will sort of disappear. Uh, but the companies, once they have merged, people forget that it's a SPAC. It, it no longer matters. It doesn't really, no one really cares whether it was a proper IPO or a direct listing or a SPAC listing. At the end of the day, what matters is the company and their numbers. So, um, uh, um, Okay, Batty is talking about uh, BFARF again, which is a rather unfortunate ticker, sticker symbol, isn't it? And we can have a look at that. BlackBerry is announcing on the 30th of March, says Philco. Okay, uh, uh, Philco, I think that'll have to go in the diary, don't you think? I'm going to write it down here. BlackBerry 30 March uh, earnings. Um, we're going to have to make a party out of that. Uh, any thoughts on Jihu IPO? They are like Reddit of China, says uh, Xi Bin Huang there. I don't know that much about the, the fundamental business there, I, I must say, Shibin. I, I don't really like to comment if I don't know that much about it. Um, can you look at Pfizer? Um, we have a strong earnings report, uh, plus possible as a new CEO on 20th of April. Your opinion, please, you're not. I gladly look at Pfizer. It's Pfizer, not Pfizer. I was thinking Pfizer. That's an unusual one. We can have a quick look at that. Um, uh, there's an extra letter in here. What's the ticker? Let me know the ticker. I'll look at it. Um, the Q4 and four-year uh, earnings report. Uh, Philco, you're going to be jumping up and down in excitement on, on, on that call, aren't you? I look forward to it. Um, uh, are you interested and excited about space, SP, SP? I am, yes. I'm very much interested and excited about space. I think uh, to say it's the new next frontier is very cliche, so I'm not going to do that. Um, why is it exciting? Well, I think there is, um, in the whole space sector, uh, obviously, communication is a huge issue. I think, um, like Tesla's plan to bring, you know, fast Wi-Fi to everywhere, for example, uh, that is a is a, a, a not just a noble endeavor, but I think it'll be a profitable one in the long run. Because, quite frankly, laying cables is pretty um, uh, silly. It's pretty expensive. Also, I've got two Wi-Fi uh, lines in, in, in here in my, in my place and incredibly expensive to put them in and, and just stupidly cumbersome and labor intensive and probably not profitable for the company putting them in. So I think on that uh, one alone, space travel, I mean, that's nice and all, but at the moment, I'm not that excited by it. I think uh, getting stuff into the orbit that is useful for actually usage down here on Earth is more what I'm excited about. Uh, I think uh, let's leave the research and the space travel to the astronauts uh, from a business point of view. I mean, if you want to go, by all means go. Uh, but I think that isn't really where the business is. I think a lot of the kind of space excitement isn't really space, but it's kind of somewhere in between, you know, where we are here and, and the sky up there. So a lot of the um, the more drone stuff, and a lot of more, more those kind of things, I think there is a lot of potential in, in, in that. Um, but quite hard at this point to tell good businesses from bad. I mean, I think Tesla is doing a very good job there. SpaceX, if they if they spin that out um, or, you know, list it, I, I would be game for that. But um, at the moment, you know, that's probably unlikely to happen. Um, and Phil is asking, what's the significance of the 10-year yield compared to the rest? That's a really good question. I, I like people asking questions. Well, if you look at them here, 10 yields, uh, actually the shorter ones are actually going up even more. So the 10-year one is, for some reason, something people look at. It has probably something to do a little bit, a lot of discounted cash flow models are done on a 10-year basis. Um, and basically, if your inflation goes up over that future predicted earnings, you have to convert that future earnings to present value. To do that, you need to take into account inflation and also alternative investment opportunities and bond yields is therefore important on that. So you therefore are reducing the value of your future revenue for growth stocks. So the higher the growth and the more forward-looking we are, 
the more it hits them. Therefore, it hits the high growth stuff hardest. So um, why do they pick out the 10 year one particularly? I, I, I think it's just sort of habit. I think that's probably got nothing to do. You could look at the seven year one, right? Or the 20 year one um, if equally. Uh, I think they're equally be ha um, relevant. You can, however, see here that, you know, they are all moving up relatively quickly. Um, so I, I don't think it, it would really matter um, in, in the long run. Uh, Phil is still excited about BlackBerry here. What do you think about uh, Joomla today uh, only up 10% uh, 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 down? Okay, let's have a quick look at that. Uh, where are we here with PLTR? Uh, Joomla. Joom, Joomla, rather, sorry. Uh, let's have a quick look at that here. Today down 10%. Crikey. Um, yeah, we dropped, we dropped pretty substantially today, didn't we? So uh, what do we see on this chart? Well, let's have put on some moving average lines. So we got a buy signal actually here. You see that here in the background where that turquoise line crosses above the blue line? That was a buy signal. And that was only um, that was on the 16th of March, basically. So that was pretty recent. Um, volume is falling off. I think that's one thing we can, we can see definitely down here. And volume is falling off, and that is kind of what causes the rally to fizzle out. So people are sort of thinking that this is pushing uh, the boundaries of where the stock could be. Let's put on some Fibonacci uh, lines here, and you can basically see, I think, that that $50 line uh, was proving a bit too much for it here. You see that green line, the $50 lines? Uh, we pushed it through it, uh, but then we fell off it, and we tried it again yesterday but we didn't quite get there. Uh, so today uh, we are basically, we've lost momentum uh, and now we are on the way down. Let's have a look at a couple of momentum indicators here. Uh, Williams are, I still have cat fur in my face. Ayah. Now uh, there again, we get a buy signal on the 10th of March uh, here. Uh, and we are still actually, momentum still looks pretty good, but it is declining. You can see that here, it is declining. So it wouldn't call it a sell signal at this point. It is just a momentum is, is softening off. Now, if we look at this a bit more closely, say on a two hour basis to account for what's going on right here, right now, um, you're seeing some pretty substantial sell, sell orders here. Uh, and they are basically here uh, falling through that $44.34 uh, Fibonacci uh, resistance line. And that gives us, a, you know, when you go through one, it doesn't really matter. So when you go through one Fibonacci line, it doesn't really matter. When you go through two, you have a trend. So we therefore have a Fibonacci sell-off trend here. Uh, and that is basically, you know, that direction here. And we have just gone through the one below and that held up. So that gives you a little bit of support because we went through it, it will be still above it. So we are still above that 44.34. Um, the, the, the next one down, so to speak. So this stock is uh, at this point, balancing out here uh, above 44.34. Uh, we did get a sell signal, however, just before that here, but this is very short term. This is kind of two hours by two hours, uh, which you can which you can see here. So it is just having a bit of a bit of a choppy time, really. I think that's what it is. It looks though at the moment like it's finding some support here, uh, just above forty-four dollars. Um, let's just go back to the one-day chart here. What do we have? Have we got there? We got some support there at, at that line. Yeah, we actually sort of well, we have support from. Maybe let me make this a little bit bigger, guys, because it's probably hard for you to see if you are on a small screen. Particularly, it's hard for me to see. In fact, so let me close this. And let me see if this will let me zoom in. There it is. It, it will. So well, you can see it's the, um, you see that low there? That is a support line, right? Uh, and where we are at the moment, you see that dotted line? That, that's where the price is right now. You can see there is a low here, which we hit at that price point, and another one there. So actually where we are really right here, right now, uh, there is support and that is around 44.77 or so. I'm just going to put a line in here. If we dip a little bit lower, then there is a little bit support here at 43 or so. Uh, and then there's a couple or more, but there a little bit stronger support again at $41. So that's kind of my, my take on that one here. Um, Hee hee man, welcome to the chat. If 10 year deals goes to up to 199, tech stocks will go into correction territory, especially BlackBerry. Uh, well, I think they are in correction tech territory and a big welcome to the chat here. Hee <laughs> hee. Uh, great to have you on, on here. Yes, I, I think you are absolutely right. Basically, uh, the more this yield goes up and at the moment it's sitting here snugly at 1744, uh, according to this ticker. Let's just have a quick refresh. It should be live, but uh, 1747. Um, up six percent now. Uh, that yes, absolutely. The more that goes up, the more it hurts. 
the stocks with the highest future growth. That's sort of as simple as that is, because that's how the discounted cash flow models work. The more growth there is in it, the more we'll have to discount it. Um, and, and, and of course, the ones that are completely forward looking as well, they, they basically get hit the hardest. So it, basically, the more that goes up, the more tech suffers. Now, what we've been seeing the last couple of days is that we see a morning that looks like this, uh, then the stocks are uh, looking like that, basically pretty much everything down except for banks who benefit from this kind of situation because banks make more money when interest rates are higher. Um, and, you know, everything looks pretty red. And then sort of halfway through the day, people have had some lunch. Uh, they had, you know, feeling a little bit better about themselves. And somehow then we see a recovery. It'd be very, very interesting to see whether that happens again today. We have seen that quite a lot. That's why I was opening this call saying, I feel like I'm in Groundhog Day. Now, the sell-offs here for most of the sort of decent companies are not that substantial. Facebook down a percent, Palantir down a percent, Amazon down a 1.8, you know, not massive movements. So I think the market is kind of getting a little bit used to this. Tesla, though, is down 3%. Uh, a lot of that's, of course, a future growth. BlackBerry here down 2.5%. Uh, PDD is still down. That's probably still because their, their owner uh, is, re is retiring, the founder, uh, not owner. Um, what else we got down here? Ehang, okay, that's just a, a bit of a tough one, really. They are kind of trying to recover from that short attack still. A plug is still down, but then, they, you know, they have accounting issues. So um, my, my, my thoughts on that are always run. Uh, we only find out the bad news typically when it's far too late. Um, and uh, what's what's up here, really, it's the banks and it's volatility and Coupang -Kou recovering a little bit. And then I'm going to ignore GameStop here for the moment because there's no real fundamental behind that. And Alibaba is carried over the 5% good news from Hong Kong uh, to still keep it up over here. Um, uh, 10 year will drop again by year's end. Mark my words, Buffalo Bobby. And B Buffalo Bobby, I agree with you. I think we are going to see it shoot up possibly above two. And that could be in the next couple of weeks. And then I think market tends to overreact in both directions. And I think it'll go up and I think it'll go back down again. And then we're going to have another uh, te tech rally again. So I think with everything that happens at the moment, I think uh, look at it more with a little bit of a, a long term perspective. And if we look at, um, you know, the, uh, the, the yields uh, here, look at the, the 10 year chart. OK, it looks dramatic like this. Let me put in a line here and let me hide the moving averages. You can see there it is. It looks pretty dramatic uh, right on, on that perspective. You're like, oh my God, it's increasing so quickly. Uh, and then go back a little bit in time, right? Uh, and, and I think that is the perspective as longer term investors. And I recommend people long term investors. I don't make stock recommendations or anything else. But I do think saying a long term investment is a fairly inoffensive thing to say. Uh, and you see that, you know, we've had this pattern before, right? Quite a few times. In fact, uh, look here in 2016, we went up like that, like a rocket. In 2013, we did the same thing. And, you know, there have been periods in between. In, in 2011, there was a period here where we did the same thing. So it's not unusual. Uh, you get these uh, drastic reactions and then look what happens. It fizzles back down again. And then you get a drastic reaction and then it fizzles back down again. And you see that here too. Every single time it comes up, it sort of finds its way down again. And that's not necessarily because the market or the economy is crashing. It's just the uh, market seems to like to overreact for some particular reason. Um, I need to training. It's great to watch you and understand my portfolio is all red, Fergus. Fergus, I'm very sorry that your portfolio is all red. I think really... Um, you know, I, I think most of our portfolios are largely red. I think the one thing to think about is have a look at um, what's going on here, because not everything is red, right? Uh, a, a more diversified portfolio, I think, in the long run provides higher returns. I think most studies show that. So there is no harm in throwing in a few boring things, a bit of value stocks, whether that's, you know, Berkshire or some sort of fund like that, or, you know, some a bit of financials, a bit of JP Morgan, a bit of Visa, a bit of MasterCard, you know, those kind of things will then move in opposite directions and it'll give you less volatility. And actually, in the long run, it might make you make, make your portfolio better. And you can also use that money then if the financials go up and then you could reinvest into tech, for example, if you wanted to. I'm not suggesting that, but, you know, you there are there are places you can do with that. So I think if a portfolio is down entirely, I would generally say think about diversification, uh, not particularly this particular second, but just think about uh, whether you are happy with your kind of volatility. And some people are. I mean, some people say I hold one thing and it's Bitcoin and, you know, good on them if that's what they're happy with. Uh, I, I prefer to have a little bit more of a, of a spread in there. But um uh, good on you and getting on on, on the investment uh, thing. It, it is in the long run, uh, basically, uh, you win in the short run, uh, not necessarily. 
Um, Filco, I, I don't think I'm quite a, a, a teacher. I think I just rant a lot, but thank you, Filco. That's very kind of you. Uh, Lily is saying, I hope Neo goes down again. Good opportunity by the dip. And I love ne uh, you, you, Lily, for your uh, never ending optimism on, on Neo. Let's have a quick look at the Neo chart here. Uh, what's going on? Let's make that a little bit bigger. So you can see from a momentum point of view here, down Williams R is sort of moving a little bit sideways, but it's still in a positive uh, field. Um, now, what was I saying yesterday? And I don't uh, sort of uh, count myself as a great predictor. I just look at what the technicals uh, indicate to me. Uh, I was saying that I thought we were going to move in this kind of uh, area here, uh, not that particular square, but between these two lines, 41 and 46. I kind of think that, you know, at the moment, that's kind of where we are because we're not really going to get massive aptitude trajectory for most of the EV stocks because of the, the chip and battery shortage. They're not going to be able to overwhelm us with delivery numbers. Um, I think March could be the best month ever for NEO. I think there's a good chance of that happening, but then uh, April, May, June will be relatively flat at that sort of level. Um, now, what we were hoping for, can you see in the background there, that blue line and that red line? The blue line is the five-day moving average and the red one is the 20-day moving average. We were hoping they would cross, uh, make out and, and move in opposite directions. And at the moment, they're moving in parallel. If they cross and when they cross, it's a buy signal. Uh, at the moment, though, they are both moving down uh, because the stock is moving down. So all we need is basically a, a sort of flat day or a slightly positive day uh, from NEO. And you are going to get that bicycle. And I think that's going to be a positive uh, here for, for NEO. We had yesterday a, a pretty healthy day, some nice volume uh, and, and, and a good day really overall, uh, which also reaffirmed just here our support line there. You see that red line there because the little end of, I mean, I'll magnify that for you guys. The, the little end of that tail almost touched that there. That's around 4120 or thereabouts. Um, so that is good. That's why I actually, I like the zigzags. I don't mind them. Of course, in the long run, I prefer everything to, to you, know, you know, keep shooting up, but testing, retesting and retesting and retesting. Every time it dips and it goes back up again, you are basically getting um, a new support and it gives us more stability here. Um, uh, Lily saying, what price level is the buy signal? Well, it isn't really a clear uh, buy signal yet. Why? Because we haven't had a sell signal. So if I look at my momentum indicator here, we got a buy signal on the 10th of March, uh, which is, you know, basically if I put in a, li a horizontal line here, and then I'm going to point to that there. And you see where that line crosses? Uh, that is the buy signal. We are still above it. So we haven't had a sell signal. Therefore, we also don't have a clear buy signal. Now, we are in this area. Now, I, I would probably say if we fall again below $38, and I am not thinking that we will, I think then that might be a, a good buy signal. You know, we were as low as uh, $34.90. Now, that was a, that was a good, good entry point. But you know, I think in the long run, one doesn't have to buy the dip, the exact dip. It doesn't really matter in the long run whether you buy things a dollar or two or two up. Um, uh, I'm just looking at my screen. I've got some uh, news up. As a Hang Seng today, it was up 1.28%. In uh, the Japanese markets were up 1%. Basically, Asian markets had a really lovely day. Uh, on the lovely day the US had yesterday, and then uh, bond yields are, are, you know, ruining it for us again. Um, uh, Anno, high competition in the EV in China, uh, says Anno. Uh, yes, I agree with you. There are a lot of car manufacturers in, in there. A lot of the old guard, BAIC, SAIC, etc., JAC, uh, GAAC, they're all, they're all there. You know, Volkswagen, everyone's there, GM, everyone. Uh, Rover is doing a good job as well over here in China. Anno, I absolutely agree with you. I think they are putting out decent cars. Uh, and a lot of people will. Um, the excitement, I guess, around the pure EV plays is that they are pure EV plays and we see them in the very near term becoming a sort of software streaming companies, essentially. Pablo says, I own 3,237 shares of NEO. I'm not worried in the least the fundamentals of NEO are all there. I'll keep buying it. Buffalo, I, I like your conviction. Um, I, I tend to agree with you. I think in the long run, I think NEO will, will do well. And I think at the moment, the valuation uh, the prices are reasonable. I think once we get sort of above eighty dollars at the moment, we are looking. We are quite far forward looking. Uh, and again, I can, um, you know, if you uh, have a look at my my discounted cash flow models over on the on the Patreon, do have a look at that. Um, and I sort of get us up to that kind of area. Much beyond that, I think we need a little bit more clarity. I don't think it's. I think it's going to come. But at the moment, we are in this area where there's some uncertainty about. Uh, just how much, um, you know, how many chips are available, how many batteries are available, sort of thing. So Nasdaq at the moment is down 1.3%. Dow Jones, on the hand, other hand, is up 0.3%. Uh, and that is kind of what I was talking about, that 
you know, diversification gives you some green stuff in your in your portfolio. Whereas if you are pure tech, uh, and you know, I, I admire people who have that uh, that conviction to be pure tech. Um, I, I like to be a little bit more more averaged out on other things. So what what's going on here? Who's selling the most? Or oh, actually, let's have a quick look at who's got the biggest volume. That's always interesting. Sundial has always massive volume. I mean, absolutely insane. Um, that's four times bigger than Apple. That's some, really something to pull off here. Uh, the bank's Neo is up here in our list here. Uh, fourth, a pretty so sizable volume at 24 million this early in the day, uh, down two and a half percent. Let's hope that improves a little bit. Uh, we could pull that open and have a quick look at what's going on here. Uh, just have a get a feel for the size of what of, of what's buying, who's buying here. Um, what's going on with the chart since we opened. So this is the day here. We basically opened the day at here. Uh, let me put a line in there, guys. So it's clear to see. Uh, there is the red line. That's the beginning of the day. So we are zigzagging up and down quite a lot. So it isn't, we opened down, right? There's a gap between yesterday and today, but actually to the in the day, we are kind of zigzagging up and down and we are establishing quite a lot of support at sort of $43, uh, $43.30, that kind of range. Um, at the moment, we're obviously sitting a little higher at $43.50. Um, so yeah, we're kind of we're doing a proper zigzag here, basically, which is good. It, it just means that it drops a little bit and people are like, ah, that's a buying routine, they're buying in. And somebody sells and someone else snaps it back up. And that's kind of what you want to see to, to build some stability here. Um, will GME enter the uh, the heat map again, <laughs> Lily? Ha ha ha. Well, it, it, it might. I don't know. I mean, uh, the, I think the, the, this one, I think here is done on, uh, I think it's on market cap, right? Uh, the, the size of these squares. An interesting thing we can also look at is uh, is the short, the float, uh, short as a percentage of the float and see if anybody's got crazy numbers on here. Walmart's still massively shorted. Uh, I don't really know why. I don't normally look into Walmart particularly, although I do think uh, they might benefit from this particular uh, administration. Rocket is at 35%. Uh, Aeon is fairly high. Snow is still very high. But uh, in our kind of field here, and Neo sitting snugly at 12%. That's not massively high. Can you see that, guys? A little, um, I don't know if you can just make that out. Uh, there is a little um, white line next to where it says Neo that tells you uh, the, the history of, um, of the short interest in, in Neos. It's actually at a relatively low level. We were above 20 for quite a long period. Uh, Lee uh, popping up here also, and uh, you know, FSR, Nicola, et cetera. I think some bad news out on Nikola today, right? Uh, but yeah, let's uh, uh, have a look at the performance again here. We see what's going on. So yeah, a lot of the, the more defensive plays are strangely enough selling off. And that's kind of the market doesn't always make sense. I think, you know, you would think that something like a Facebook or a, or a Microsoft would actually attract money in this, uh, this, this particular cycle that we are in uh, because they are actually quite defensive stocks, but uh, not so today. So a fickle market here. Let me look at some of your questions, guys, here. Um, Xpang is shrugging off those bond yields. What bonds? Uh, says Foxon. Absolutely, Foxon. Fantastic to have you on the chat. Excuse me that I keep scratching my nose. I have cat fur in my face. Uh, I was joined earlier by my chief analyst. So uh, absolutely, uh, Xpang. Well, Xpang is now at zero uh, on, on, on my list here. Um, where, 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 where did it go? Let's uh, look at the uh, percentage change. So, uh, up, okay, 0.14 of a percent now. Uh, Lee also up half a percent. And that, that's good. I'm, I'm glad to see that. Those two are, in a sense, the more conservative uh, EV stocks because they are both closer to profitability. They are both a little bit more kind of... Um, down to earth kind of stocks. You're not really promising us the earth. The valuations are, are, are perhaps also. So, um, uh, Shivan is saying that if you're in Shenzhen, if you want a, 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 li actually a licensed CLC, that's in the last car must be an EV. I think more cities will do that very bullish on the EV future. Shivan, thank you for sharing that with us. That is, I think, the story in most cities now in China, at least the bigger ones, that you basically cannot get a license to buy an ICE car. You simply won't get one unless you give up your old one, then you can recycle it. Um, however, if you want to buy, if you buy an EV, then you get a license, a pure EV. I think it's also changing to pure EVs. I think that this kind of hybrid plug-in type, type stuff is also going to go out of the window. Uh, and now that's going to be a massive boon for the whole EV industry. And that's basically China encouraging that. That is their kind of indirect subsidy, which is incredibly effective. Lily says, Neo's on the heat map. Yes, absolutely. Of course it is. Um, 
Nasdaq gone, uh, is it? Today is very red for me, says the, the Kunz brothers. So I'm very sorry about that. I think it's probably red for most people. However, I would say the last couple of days have always started like that. And at the end of the day, things did turn around. So the sell-off isn't like crazy, right? We're sort of down mostly one point something percent. So it, it the market, I think, is becoming a little bit more resilient to these uh, bond increases. Here, here it says 1.74 now. Let me just hit refresh on that. Um, 1.742. So um, that is is up 5.8%. It was up about 6% uh, earlier when we looked. So it's coming down a little bit also. So it'd be interesting to see what happens at the end of the day. Sometimes I wish I could fast forward to the end of the day. Uh, sadly, that is not within my powers. Um, uh, Filco, why are you becoming bullish on CCIV? Personally, I would wait till they are closer to shipping out their first vehicle to buy into it. Curious to know your thoughts. I will gladly talk about that, Philco. Absolutely. Well, there are a couple of news items out. I've actually got them open here. So they just have an approval uh, from the Casa Grande City Council to start the expansion of their car plant here. And what that, is that all about? That's about what they call Project Gravity. It's basically their SUV. And the SUV is apparently being launched um, in 2023, which is fairly soon. In Volkswagen days, that is tomorrow. Um, that's a bit of an insider joke there if you joined the battery day of Volkswagen. Uh, and Phil Coleman know what I mean. So that is fairly soon. So I'm quite pleased that they actually have an SUV coming out. Uh, I think that's a big must. If you if you are launching in the US, you need an SUV. Um, the, the factory has massive capacity, capacity space. There is a rumor also they're planning a second plant in Saudi. And that is also interesting because Saudi uh, and the whole Gulf nations are also moving away from oil to you know, uh, EVs. So you have that market there, which is very high end. Uh, from there, you could also supply you know, the, the Indian subcontinent. You could supply Asia. Uh, you could supply Europe. There, it's very, very close. You look at a map, there is a, there's a canal there through the Red Sea. Uh, so that opens up a whole new game for me. And it just, to me, indicates that they are the Saudis. Well, the Saudis, I think, are fantastic investors because they buy stuff and hold it. And I mean, really hold it, like decades, because they've got money pouring in like, you know, every day. They don't need to ever sell anything. If they sell something like, what are we going to do with those extra 10 billion, uh, you know? So I think they have that fantastic partner there. Now, if we look a little bit at uh, some of the, just to get some of the news coverage out here, basically, um, you know, of course, this is PR. You have to bear that in mind. But, you know, here is a, a Detroit-based uh, analyst. He's saying a realistic roadmap. They haven't overspent. Uh, they th I think the lucid air and the gravity will appeal to premium people. They think it might be more appealing to luxury customers than the Model S. And I don't want to back Tesla. I think it's a fantastic car. But in terms of size, if you sat in the back of a Model S, it isn't quite a Mercedes S-Class or a BMW 750 or something like that. You just haven't quite got that space there. It's a fantastic car to drive, but it isn't quite that really luxury sedan where you want to sit in and really you know, feel very luxurious in. So it's more sporty than really luxurious. So I kind of see that point there. Um, then it's, they're saying you know, they've got 2,000 employees now. Apparently that's going to increase to up to 4,000 next year. Now, I don't value companies on how many employees they have, but it just shows how they're ramping up production. Uh, and the uh, expansion that they are, they're planning or they're doing at the moment, they got the permission for, will uh, take their capacity up from 34,000 to 90,000. So they are obviously expecting the, the SUV to sort of ro rather roll off. Um, their battery technology is good. It's being used in Formula E, which if you haven't uh, gone and seen it yet, it's, 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 a, it's a great hoot. So do go and see that. And um, I think really the Saudi funds, I think that's for me an interesting one. Um, and, and here, I think that's a good quote actually from, from Rawlinson. He's saying, there's been too much focus on the SPAC. He said, we are a tech play and there are only two tech plays, Lucid and Tesla. And I'm getting over the, 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 the SPAC thing because the way it was handled, I thought was pretty appalling. Uh, I, I didn't like the way they sort of screwed investors there, kind of encouraging this speculation with their daily leaks to Bloomberg or you know, Reuters, whoever it was, and then kind of shooting uh, them down by 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 you know selling shares at fifteen dollars when the price was at fifty. So I think that wasn't very well handled. But we're not going to have to get over that. And in a sense, you could see well they are you know capitalists of the of the highest order. These guys and perhaps that's a good thing in the long run. I mean it doesn't make me like them particularly, but I think it doesn't make me a, not dislike the success of the business. Now he says there are only two tech plays, Lucid and Tesla, and I can hear some of you jumping up and down. What about Neo? US tech place. And that is really, I think, what 
I mean, I've been thinking and saying occasionally if you joined me for these chats before, and if you haven't, you missed hitting that subscribe button, guys. That's the way you get here. So do do that, and that way uh, uh, YouTube suggests you uh, more videos, not just for me, but more videos uh, on, on, on similar content. So uh, that's one of the benefits of hitting subscribe, guys. American investors like to invest in American stocks. Uh, the fact that they're investing in NEO is a huge leap of faith. It's unusual to this degree. And it's basically because there isn't an alternative in the US, um, apart from Tesla. But there isn't a second player. And there's room for a second player because Teslas are great. They're fantastic. It's an amazing, beautiful company. But not everybody wants to drive a Tesla. Not everybody wants to have the same car. That is just the way the car industry works. There's always space for a competitor. Uh, to coexist very happily. And I think Lucid can be that. They're positioning themselves, I think, in a premium way, which I think is the smart way to do it. They've got the right backers. They've got people with that sort of, you know, Tesla cachet of, of history where they came from. Um, the original Chinese investors in that make me also more positive on it. And they do seem to be doing the right things. And they've got very long-term in, in, in core investors in there. And if you look at their stock, uh, let me pull that up. Um, Okay, we're on a we on a one minute scale. That's why this chart looks strange. If you look at this stock here, uh, and let me just do something. I want to compare it. Okay, let me get rid of some of these to Neo. Uh, why do I want to do that? Because uh, I want to zoom in on this. How do I do that? Um, here we go. So I, I painted this in earlier because I actually uh, was preparing a video on this. But Filko, you asked me, so I will I will tell you what my thoughts are. Um, okay, we need to zoom in on this a little bit and shift it over a bit. It's a bit of a process. Bear with me. Uh, we will get there. We will fight the chart till we see what we want to see. So uh, what am I talking about here? Well, can you see what I painted in here in, in pink? Um, maybe I'll, I'll do it again for dramatic effect. So uh, the... Uh, Neo stock, this is at listing 2018. It lists, it goes up uh, three times or something like that. Um, and we, you know, it, well, at least doubles or triples. Uh, and then it goes down again this way, right? And at the time, then Neo was at sort of five, six dollars. And what do we see up here with Lucid? This is sort of the listing equivalent of Lucid. It goes up and it goes down here. And you see that pattern quite a lot. Uh, why is that? Because we are very excited about EVs. We're very excited about the future of it. And then, the, you know, it goes into, uh, into the up in the sky and the moon somewhere in the space. And we think, wow, that valuation is really a bit crazy, isn't it? I think we've overdone it here. Uh, they haven't sold the car yet. So then it comes crashing down again. And I think that is also what happened to Churchill Capital. Now, Churchill Capital's market cap, guys, is 7.5 billion. Uh, Neos is, uh, what, what is it at the moment? Uh, 56 billion. It was up to 80 at one point. So about nine times higher. It took Neo about two years to a year and a half to do what Tesla did in 10. So if you look at this chart here, I'm going to compress it again here. Uh, and I'm oh, sorry, I'm painting. Uh, and you look at what it took to actually get proper growth in here. It took quite some time, right? If you look at that, you see how long it took for us to actually get growth trajectory. It took from 2018 to basically uh, the uh, sort of middle end of 2020 um, to actually get that massive explosive growth. So that's about, about, about two years. If you look at the Tesla chart, uh, it took them from, when did they list? You know, ages, ages ago. It basically took them about 10 years. You can see that it's just flat, 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 flattish to actually get that explosive growth. Why did Neo do it in such a short period? Because Tesla has shown us how it can be done. So they did it in, you know, in, in, in a tenth of the period. And my bet is that CCIV will do it in a tenth of the period again or thereabouts. So I think they will do in months what Neo has done in years. I think they are going to get that forward trajectory, that that the, the benefit of the doubt. Um, and the forward valuation. And if I think that they are going to reach something like NEO sales in, say, a year or two years' time, say, if they shift, you know, 20, 30, 40,000 cars in two years' time, which they could do, or even say by 2023, they'll sell 40,000 cars, then NEO's valuation at the moment is, is there, and NEO's valuation is nine times that. 
and it's an American stock. There are a lot of investors, and you guys might not be part of that, uh, but a lot of investors who simply won't invest in a Chinese company. They're worried about the, the, the bookkeeping and they don't know where it is. And you know the earnings report calls are two thirds in Chinese, and they just don't like any of that. The earnings reports are mainly in renminbi, and you know it's just not where they're familiar. They'd rather buy something American, and 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 it's a fair view, and a lot of people have that. I'm not. I'm not criticizing it, I think it's just an observation. Uh, and I think they are therefore going to put a higher valuation on an American company that does something broadly similar. And I'm not saying they're the same companies, but I think they are broadly in the same space, uh, much like Neo is valued on the back of Tesla's success. So that's kind of a Philco, my rather uh, long uh, answer there. Apologies, I rant on sometimes. Um, uh, greetings, Baba Green in two days is something wrong, says Puppet M. <laughs> yes, I, I like how you say that. We have on our, pa our, our uh, Discord, guys, we have an Alibaba support group, Alibaba Anonymous, uh, where we you know we hold each other's hands and, and commiserate. Yes, Baba is up. Why is Baba up? It's a really interesting twist. The twist to the antitrust story is that Alibaba is getting access to Tencent's WeChat. And you might not be familiar with that, but WeChat is the number one instant messaging platform in, in, in China. Every single person I've ever met has WeChat on their phone. And it's more than messaging. There, is, there, there are apps to it. You can pay with it. Um, WeChat Pay is also the leading payment platform. It's more popular day to day than Alipay. Of course, Tencent wouldn't normally let Alibaba sell on WeChat because they're competitors but the, uh, the regulators have told them to do so. So we are apparently going to get Taobao deals, which is a sort of PDD equivalent of, uh, of Alibaba's uh, e-commerce platform um, on WeChat. Uh, and that gives them access to a whole another um, ecosystem, a whole another set of users, and literally every single message with every with absolutely anybody I know in mainland China happens on WeChat. So um, their kind of group buying type stuff, it'll all be on WeChat. So uh, that's why the stock's up. Everyone's thinking, wow, that's such a boon uh, for Alibaba. We didn't really see that one coming. So there is some positive news there. Uh, uh, Julian, uh, welcome to the chat. What did I miss? Well, good question, really. Uh, we'll do a quick roundup. And anyway, people are asking questions, which is great. Uh, if Hilke is saying well, that was insightful on sharing CCIV, Hilke, I mean, please, if you disagree with me, if you think uh, this is a, a company with no sales, nothing's ever going to happen, you think the cars are terrible, you think they're going to implode, tell me, let me know, uh, put it in the comments below, or you can shout it on the Discord when we talk about EVs. Um, I, I like to get opposing views. I think it makes us all smarter as a community, and that's kind of also what our, our Discord is achieving, I, I, I hope, and, and Philco is uh, leading that group. So uh, Dixon, just focusing on American company, is, is myopic. Uh, Dixon, I think it is just a reality. I think you have to look at that. Look at Alibaba's valuation versus Amazon's, right? Alibaba has better fundamentals and numbers than, than Amazon. Uh, yet the valuation from a PE ratio is about a third, though margins are four times uh, that. So it, it is just, I think, a reality if you accept, you can't change it. It's not really about beliefs or politics or any of that. It's just, it's a market fact. That's the way I look at it. So therefore, I, I am uh, becoming much, much more bullish on CCIV or lucid, as we are soon going to call it. And that will also be a big impact shift there. Um, uh, the, the meme picture, Lily, yes, that was a funny one. Uh, I, I, I don't know who, who drew that. Um, Uh, funny issues talking about uh, diesel ICE trucks uh, forever. There is an advantage in those simple old engines, they work forever. And if you ever looked into marine engines, they basically use a similar system. Why? Because they're incredibly reliable, very few parts, very hard to break, very easy to fix. So uh, yes, there is something in that uh, for kind of hardship uh, user, users. Um, EVs might be, a, might be a challenge. If you live somewhere that's incredibly dusty, incredibly uh, cold, incredibly hot or something, the technology might not be so ideal. And you see a little bit of that in China, in northern China, where it's very, very cold in the winter, sort of, you know, minus 30 Celsius. Uh, and, and I've been there in the winter. It really is, is very, very cold. You step outside, you think, oh my God, I'm going to die. Uh, but, but you don't. It just feels like that. Um, you know, the, the battery performance, for example, drops. But from an engine point of view, uh, extreme weather and, and dust and stuff like that is an issue, funny issue. You're absolutely right. Uh, the adoption there will take long. But you know what? There will be an absolute glut of ICE diesel cars uh, and they were all going to get shipped to the third world. So there will be a, 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 a oversupply of those there for some time as well. Abby, any thoughts on Fisker? Abby, welcome to the membership, Abby. Uh, let's have a quick look at the Fisker uh, chart here. Um, now, Fisker allegedly is building their cars in China, right? 
uh, which uh, it makes it a slightly less American story. Uh, although, of course, in reality, oh, sorry, I pulled it up. Let me let me, let me get this back to uh, just the one window. Uh, we pull up Fisker. Fisker, Fisker, Fisker. Okay, so let's look a little bit at the, at the history of Fisker here. Uh, since 2019, not doing a great deal. Look at this on the percentage scale. So you can sort of see up 10% or so. And then we can see this explosive growth. Uh, and then it comes back down to Earth. So let's look at this at a little bit of a more current uh, trajectory. What do we get here? Well, the first thing that jumps uh, out is that we have a cell signal here. Where's my arrow? My arrow is here, uh, thereabouts. Uh, well, not quite, but come on, arrow, don't snap into place. Why does it do that to me? I don't know. Uh, anyway, I'll magnify it for you guys. You see that blue line crosses from above below the... Um, 20 day moving average line, that's a sell signal here that was yesterday. Uh, and the market is, 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 is following that cue, uh, we can see. So our kind of positive trajectory we had here, we looked at this last, I think, around the 10th of March. So hence our upward line here, that story has turned around a, a great deal. Um, why? Uh, well, our rally here really fizzled out on volume. I think that's really the reason here. So that, that was the, the time when we are still going up here with the stock. So you can see that is uh, where we are going here. I'm just connecting those two pink lines so you can see uh, what I'm talking about. Uh, when you are in a rally upwards, watch out for volume. If they fall off substantially, then uh, then you are near the, near the top of it typically. So that's what we're seeing there. Let's look at some momentum indicators here. Uh, let's look at Williams R. I could probably close that one here. Don't need to see the live trade. So Williams R also giving us a sell signal here. Um, I'm putting in this horizontal line. For me, that is the line that acts as a buy or sell signal. Uh, and I think quite a lot of people would probably agree with that. So we got a bit of a buy signal here. We turned around very quickly and then we went back down again. And now we are, and that is perhaps the silver lining here. We are in the oversold territory. So this bit down here, uh, what I'm crudely uh, painting on that whole area down here below that um, sort of dashed line, that is the oversold territory. Typically, when you are in that area, let me just move that, uh, you know, you sort of you dip into that and then typically you come back out of it again and, and you, you have another rally. Uh, but you can be down there for quite some time. So momentum, uh, not looking very positive at the moment at, at, at Fisker. Um, is it a buy opportunity? I, I, I think it, it has the uh, opportunity to fall a little bit lower. Though to, so far today, the low is higher than yesterday and that is building support. So there is actually starting to be, and obviously we're only halfway through the day and not even that, uh, but you can see here, there is some support here from where we were yesterday. We haven't quite dipped that, we haven't broken that. And that is uh, at what level? Uh, that is around 2025. So 2025, I think you're acting as a bit of support, not massive support, but some support. If we dip below that, then I think we are a little bit in free fall till about 19 uh, 20, I would say. Why do I say that? That was the low here. You see the end of that tail of that candle here. And that was the opening uh, of that day here when we were rallying. So a double support there, guys. Um, uh, Felix, is the US government still making new announcements about the bond yields or is it done and bond yields are still waiting to stabilize yearly? And so no, there are no, no announcements on that today. Actually, the Fed chairman is speaking today at a conference, but I doubt he'll touch on this subject. He basically said what he wanted to say yesterday. Maybe he'll make a remark on it and maybe people will pick up on that. I still have cat fur in my face, guys. Sorry. Um, I live in a household run by cats. So no, there are no announcements. And that's kind of what we get uh, of late is that he makes an announcement, the bond yields come down. Uh, and then um, people go to bed and wake up again and they're thinking, oh my God, I'm still worried about bond yields. And then they go up again. Uh, and at the moment, they're sitting here at 1733, uh, at 5.2%. That's less than this morning. Um, and, and I mean, uh, it was it was about 6% when I started looking at this today. So it's calming down a little, uh, but it is still up. And then the market is still looking pretty red here. Let me just hit the refresh button on this. Um, banks still benefiting here from this. Baba's still up. Let's have a look at the live stocks. This is absolutely live here to the second, guys. Uh, I, 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 I pay for the NASDAQ feed because it's quite useful to have, I think. Um, a few companies here. NNVC is moving into the uh, positive sector. sector. Uh, Lee and XBank still looking good. Alibaba still looking very solid, 1.8% up. Uh, that's, of course, buoyed by the good performance in Hong Kong today, up almost 5%. Coupang recovering a little bit here, but still, I think, in my view, an overvalued play at the moment. Uh, NEO, on the other hand, uh, where, where did NEO go? 
um, down 2% on pretty sizable volume, 28 million. So uh, that is looking in Tesla down 2.6%, 2.5% now on, on not very big volume. So that's kind of interesting to see there. Um, Ehang CrowdStrike Square. Let's have a quick look at who are our biggest winners. Wow, the bank's really gaining here today. 3.75% on JP Morgan. I was thinking of buying, but buying, buying some JP Morgan, but then I thought better of it. I actually have quite a lot of value stuff. I don't think I really need JP Morgan, but thanks for that question, Lily. Um, and Philco is saying, I wouldn't trust Henry Fisker at the moment. He hasn't, has been a leader of a failed company in the past. Now it would take more money than fancy models and renders for me to believe in the company. Um, uh, thank you for sharing that, uh, Philco. Uh, what's your thoughts on Hillian, says Flapping Flap. You know what? I was excited about Hillian. And then I made the mistake of listening to the earnings call. Uh, and if you want to get a feel for that, it's on my, my Hillian playlist. Just listen to five minutes of it. Listen to it Don't waste an hour. Listen to five minutes of their presentation or go to the end, near the end of it when you have the questions and answers from analysts. Uh, and I must say, I've never felt such a sort of lethargy, such lack of energy and excitement from any company uh, before. Uh, and to me, that might sound very shallow. That might sound sort of very emotional. Uh, but I like the guys who run these companies to be excited about what they're doing and and and, uh, and bullish on it. And, and those guys were just sitting there going, yeah, we're doing this. Um, and I'm answering your question. So that was kind of my impression on that. I, 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 some of you guys joined me on that. Uh, and I think it was the worst earnings call I've, I've heard probably in, in, in a year or so. So if for that reason, I am not really that keen on it. I, I like the business model. I think the what they're doing from a tech point of view is interesting. Um, I think the question is really, is what they're do, doing so unique? And is it is it protected? Or can, say, General Motors or any of the tr big truck companies simply do it themselves? Uh, do they really need them? The guys running it to me sounded unconvinced of their own business success. And that to me is a is, is a big red flag. And that's really why I re highly recommend listening to earnings calls, guys. Um, there is a big one coming up in about three weeks or so, which is the Palantir one. So I highly recommend you listen to that one. Uh, and uh, Philco just shouted out the BlackBerry one is coming up. And even if you're not invested in the stock, just listen in for 15 minutes or so. You get a feel for it. Uh, maybe not the presentation bit at the beginning, because that can be a little bit um, kind of monotonous. But just wait till the end of that call. They're typically about an hour long. The analysts ask questions and you get a real kind of insight. You hear the CEO, the CFO talking, uh, chatting with the analysts that they know. Uh, and you really get a feel for, I think, how these guys think. So yeah, that's my, my thoughts on that fluffing fluff. I'm not a big fan of that. Um, uh, Philco is also saying we would we, you know, we went from bullish to uninterested after the call, unfortunately for the potential of the company. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Philco. That was really an appalling presentation. I mean, the um, the Volkswagen battery days hasn't, hasn't has not turned me off Volkswagen uh, to the extent that that Hillian turned me off their their company. There, um, am I pronouncing that right? Um, I, I still don't know. Um, uh, yeah, no worries. You, you weren't there flapping, flapping. Just literally go on the playlist. I have a Hillian playlist. Just listen to 10 minutes of it, five minutes of it. Zoom around a little bit in that video and you get a feel. If the Tesla ban in China is going to make Neo's price drops as Lily, I mean, is there really going to be a Tesla ban? I, I kind of don't think so. I mean, China has invited Tesla in as the first foreign company that's wholly owned a foreign enterprise from a car manufacturer. I think they value the tech, the R&D they bring. I think the investment and the jobs also. Uh, they push the Chinese EV sector forward. I think that's the role of Tesla. Is Tesla in the long run going to be successful in China? I think so, yes. And, and I think, look at just Volkswagen, for example. Volkswagen, German car manufacturer, the number one car brand in China, right? Uh, BMW sells more than 700,000 cars. Mercedes sells more than 700,000 cars. Audi sells more than 700,000 cars in China. And they've all done that for decades. And they're very welcome there. And they're manufacturing them there. And that's kind of the requirement. I think there are some areas where Tesla will struggle. I don't think they're going to get the robo-taxi contract, uh, contracts, for example. I think there'll be a preference for, for the, 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 the true Chinese brands. Uh, but I don't think Tesla is, is going to struggle in China. I think they have a big market there. I think they're doing very well. And I think they're going to expand their production. And I think, I think it's a long-term success. But there will be some things where the government is involved, where they are supporting their homegrown industry. And, you know, that's the name of the game at the moment, right? What did Biden say on the day he went into office? He says, buy American. Uh, and that's just the, the world we live in at the moment. So, you know, it, it, it goes in both directions. Um, um, can you do an analysis on Barber or Suspicious? Absolutely. You can always ask me about Barber. I will never, ever say no. <laughs> 
Um, I actually haven't looked at it uh, today, but uh, let's have a quick look here at, at Alibaba. What is going on with Baba as it's going up, which is something that we, oh, that's not Baba, is it? We obviously looked at something else. Where did Baba go? Here's Baba. Um, right, we have from Williams R here a buy signal yesterday. Uh, putting in that line here, the line should be green because it's a buy signal. Let me just change the color, guys. Um, and if you're wondering why it's a buy signal, I'm going to put in a horizontal line here and explain it. So down here, when you when you cross that dotted line there, which is the minus 50 point line, my line is slightly off, but it doesn't really matter. It should be minus 50. When you cross that from below to above, you get a buy signal. When you're above that dotted line, you're in the over bought territory when I mean, you're below the dotted line you're in the oversold territories now uh, Baba has had a pretty miserable run where you had a sell signal here on the 19th of February or thereabouts so if you would have sold then you would have sold at 269 or so and, and now you would have bought back in at about uh, 230 so good indicator on, on, on that score I, I, I would say so that is very positive momentum and that is something we haven't seen uh, since uh, mid-January. Uh, so since mid-January, we had that nice recovery uh, all the way back up to sort of 275. And at the moment, we are looking uh, very, very positive here. You know, we, I, I think I could probably safely delete this rather depressing line because we are starting here a new recovery. Now, it is still a small recovery. It isn't a, a big sustained long one yet, but we can have a quick look at some other indicators here. MACD are also giving us a buy. You see that down here is that blue line. I know it's rather small, but the blue line crosses the orange line from below to above. It also gives us a buy signal yesterday. So MACD agrees. Well, actually not yesterday, today, I would say. So today is also a buy indicator here. Why? Well, Hong Kong was up almost 5% today on, on, on the actual share, the 9988A listing here in Hong Kong. So Baba in, in New York carrying that on. And that is essentially the story that Taobao deals, which is sort of... Um, the, the, the value e-commerce platform of uh, Alibaba, which they launched in response to PDD, um, that is going to get uh, access to WeChat, which is 10 cents, uh, massively dominating um, instant messenger, if you, if, if, for lack of a better word. It's sort of uh, WhatsApp and Facebook and shopping and payment and everything wrapped into one app. It's, it's, it is a fantastic piece of software. Uh, you can do absolutely everything with that. As long as you have your phone with you, you can do everything in, in, in China as long as you have WeChat, which everybody does. Have. So uh, this is looking pretty positive, I must say. If you look at volume uh, yesterday, volume was fairly low, um, 17 million. So today we're so far up to about 6 million. So be, hopefully uh, that's kind of what we want to see. We want the volume to pick up. Uh, if we have a rally with falling or flat volume, it isn't a great rally. So we want to kind of want to see that. Um, we Today, we uh, basically uh, broke through this, this line here at 235. That will now act as a new support line here, that green one here, the Fibonacci one. And really, we have quite a long way to go, of course. We, you know, we, we might see some resistance here at these highs of these days, which is about 240, 241 or so. So, so let's see what the day brings. But it is a, a, a fantastic day for Baba when it's green uh, two days in, in, in a row here. Thanks, so thanks for that question there. Uh, Philco says Tesla is there for the Chinese to copy their tech <laughs> and some big eyes. Well, that's one way of looking at it. Uh, I didn't say that, though. Hey, guys, a great um, deal of con awesome content. Uh, Gary, you're very kind, Gary, and, and thank you for your support. Uh, I'm considering Vanguard US Treasury ETFs, um, VTIP for short-term parking of cash and anticipation of April correction. Any thoughts, guys? Um, so that is basically gonna, something that goes up as the treasury yields go up. Uh, does it go up like that or does it go up with bond prices? I don't quite know how VTIP works. Um, uh, how, and how, how long and, and how short are they? Uh, short-term inflation protected. Okay. Um, so let's have a quick look at this on a, so it, it, it basically, so it goes up as the bond yield goes up. That's what this would imply, right? What's the tick of VTIP? Okay. Let's have a quick look at that, uh, on here. You pull up VTIP, uh, and then next to that, we'll put uh, DGS 10 and we compare that DGS 10. So just to see, uh, that's not a, uh, uh here we go. Okay, let me just hide uh, all of these indicators uh, because we don't really need those. And uh, okay, 
That is, a, <laughs> that's not really going to work, is it? I need to put DGS 10 in on a different scale. So new price scale. Here we go. So there you can see, let me make both of them a line. I think for this purpose, it's easier to look at lines. So uh, how good is that correlation there? Uh, the blue line is your Vanguard uh, fund, and it might be interesting for other people also. So let's just look, have a look at this. And the yellow line is the 10-year bond yield. So yeah, pretty good correlation overall, right? When the 10-year bond yield falls off, um, which is the orange line, then that, what happened here? What was going on there? That was sort of strange dip. Okay, let's ignore that dip. Let's go back a little bit more in time. I always like to sort of backtest theories. Uh, they are broadly speaking correlated, except for 2013. It fell as the bond yield went up. Uh, so that must have meant that the short-term yields also went down. So um, it does look, at the moment at least, uh, Gary, it does look like a, a reasonably correlated play here. Um, be interesting to see what happens there. If we look at the, um, the short-term bond yields, the one-month one here is up 150%, but the two-months and the six-months one are down 11 and 22%. So I guess you're going to get some sort of mashup here. So I'd have a look at really what is it, what is it composed of? What's the timing of those bonds? Uh, but it could be an interesting one. I, I, I've not bought that myself, but thanks for throwing that out there, Gary. Um, and maybe we should also do that on the on the Discord, guys. We should have sort of a um, uh, you know where to park cash channel. I think that might be an interesting one. Something that gives us some return, uh, but not crazy risk. So on a percentage scale here, it's fairly moderate, right? So since May last year, uh, this Vanguard thing has gone up four percent. So it it hasn't given us a huge return, but a little bit of a return. So uh, there we are. Um, uh, <laughs> it's funny how the anti-monopolistic solution is, is to make monopolies work together, says Dixon. Yes. Well, I think they realize, I think there, there are realists, I think, in the Chinese government that they have let these companies establish themselves and short of breaking them up, which I think they don't want to do because it would destroy a huge value that they've created. Um, the only thing to do is to kind of open up the market a little bit. Uh, but yeah, I think I think it's not going to fundamentally change. I don't think uh, Alibaba is really going to lose its 55% market share. Uh, maybe a little bit of it, but not a great deal of it. At least that's my view of it. Um, if I had to recommend uh, you a stock as a thank you for the good work, uh, thank you, Darinos. Uh, if one can even say that, it would be Tiger, the Chinese stock that you should at least put on your radar, in my opinion. Thank you very much, Linus. We can do some more uh, thoughts on that. We have talked a little bit about that before. Uh, CH says, yes, we should do defensive stocks. Discord, absolutely. If you want to be talking about it, guys, we have a, a Discord community here, but it's pretty active, and we keep adding new channels. We added an EV raw materials channel today, and there's some actually pretty interesting uh, research some guys uh, shared uh, here earlier. I think it might still be on in the general. So if you want to join... Um, us over here and discuss and chat throughout the day uh, with me and the community uh, do. Um, uh, and I think that might be an interesting idea, actually. Let's do a defensive stock discord. I think that's a good one. Uh, Tiger. Yeah, Tiger is an interesting one. Absolutely. We can pull that up also, guys. Thank you for throwing that out there. Uh, Tiger. Um, okay, let's get rid of the TGS 10 again. Uh, and make this a proper chart. Let's have a quick look if there are any news out on Tiger here. Uh, anything particular just about ADR. Um, uh, UP Fintech holding reports sharp growth in client account in Singapore. That's not Tiger, but that's sort of vaguely related. Um, nothing kind of major jumping out here. Um, what is the stock doing? Well, I think it's it's basically following the, 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 the tech stock tech stocks, right? At the moment, you can kind of see that. It is at a bit of a recovery, a bit of a sell-off. Today is looking uh, more positive again. So you are absolutely right. I think what we're going to do, guys, we are going to add it to our screen up. I have to turn this off very briefly uh, and put Tiger in here and, and just give it a little red flag. And then it appears on our list as well. So fintechs, I, 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 I love fintechs, absolutely. So thanks for throwing that out there, Tiger. It might be interesting to do a bit of comparison. I was hoping, of course, by now that Ant would be listed and then we could do some comparisons on some of these Chinese ones. Maybe a Tiger is an interesting one to throw out there uh, up a little bit on the day. Well, it's kind of finance, isn't it? So finance does actually benefit from higher rates, you could think. 
Um, uh, Gary, I just had a list of defensive ETFs on the Discord. The other Vanguard one would be BSF. Thank you very much, Gary, uh, for sharing that with us. We can also look at that here as we are live. Uh, so these are some of the bond ones. Yeah, I mean, the only thing there is the, the, the returns are generally not particularly great, right? Because, I mean, bond uh, returns are still pretty low. But yeah, I, I see what you mean. Um, if one is more um, aggressive and one thinks there is a massive market correction coming, uh, then something like a like an you know an ultra vix or something like that is a way to go, but it does lose money over over time. So it's not a way great place to park money. It's really only something for um, the emergency break basically. So uh, RH is shout shouting at C three AI. Please please. Okay, you ask so nicely. I can't resist C three uh, AI. Um, was that the ticker? Doesn't seem to be the right uh, ticker, RH. Uh, can you check that ticker and I'll, I'll, I'll look at it again. I don't know what the symbol is otherwise, uh, but thanks for that. Um, so guys, should we do a, do a really quick, quick uh, recap of where we are? Uh, bond yields, let's just hit refresh here. At the moment, uh, up 5.16%. That is less bad than it was this morning. So they are coming down a little bit again, but it's still sitting at 1.73. Uh, and that basically has uh, the market sitting here. These are... Uh, market Dow Jones index is actually up, and that's of course the big banks pulling it up. Uh, S and P five hundred down a fraction here. Uh, this are uh, European markets actually looking fairly positive, which is surprising. Maybe that's banks also. Volatility index is up. Orange juice is up. I always like to throw that out there. I've yet to meet somebody who trades orange juice, but somebody obviously is. So um, let me know if you do. I'd love to meet you. You must be a very interesting individual. Um, uh, and the market here, let's also just hit quick refresh on here so we get a bit of an overview. Uh, basically, anything techie is down except for Oracle. Uh, that's interesting. But everything else is basically down. That's kind of techie up here. Um, IT stuff's down. Consumer cyclicals are also pretty much down, uh, with the exception of Barber, pretty much. Uh, the whole car sector is down except for GM um, and TM, Toyota. So the old guys are, are getting a little bit of love here. Ford actually also up a little bit, but nothing else. Industrials are up. Uh, that is sort of a, a, a fl you know, flight to safety as are banks down here, asset managers, uh, uh, financial stocks. Um, healthcare is up still. Uh, that's probably a, a mix of Biden and, and just, you know, what's going on in the world at present. Uh, it seems COVID numbers in Europe are, are going through the roof again, which isn't particularly encouraging. Italy, Port uh, sorry, Italy, um, Poland, Germany, uh, France, uh, getting some pretty ugly numbers there out today. Uh, people are fleeing also into Berkshire, other way. Now, that's an insurance company, really. So they also benefit from higher rates uh, there. Uh, so, but overall, a fairly uh, red morning now it looked like this yesterday guys at this time of the day so you know don't count our chickens yet it, it might still turn around uh, but here we are any big surprises from our uh, stocks we are watching well uh, look on continues its recovery sos also and then we have um, Alibaba here. That's lovely to see. Uh, Lee and Xpang maintaining green numbers, which is nice to see. Facebook is recovering a little bit here. Uh, and who is in the doghouse down here? Plug still. Well, accounting errors are a big no-no from my point of view. Uh, Tesla, however, down 3.55%. I think we can have a quick look at that. Uh, where is our Neo chart here? Um, so the here we go. Uh, here is Tesla. If you want to get your hands on these charts, guys, I do share them. I share the links uh, so they are saved here under. This is basically the Neo chart, and you can see that. Um, but we wanted to look at Tesla, which is what we're looking at here. Uh, what's Tesla doing? Tesla is uh, sort of testing this support level here at uh, 669 or thereabouts, uh, but now they are uh, back up to 676. They managed to get through um, that uh, six, what is that? What's that red line there? Uh, they went through 684, which is our, our sort of next resistance line up, and then went back down again. Uh, and we are struggling a little around the 675 mark. Let's have a look at the intraday because it's also insightful. Gives us a feel of how people are buying in or not uh, from the start of the day. This is basically uh, today. Um, 
actually, so we had a sell-off at the beginning of the day. And I think that's interesting to see. That's the sell-off. And then since then, what are we doing? We are zigzagging. We're zigzagging. Uh, and actually now, well, we are retesting a little bit here, uh, some of these lower levels today. Uh, but we are not really dropping below where we opened up, essentially. So we're, you know, from sort of 9.47 a.m. Uh, so actually, um, we're going sideways rather than continuing downways. Uh, is that a word? Downways? It isn't really, is it? Uh, down would be the word I think I was looking for. Um, so you can see here, you can also see that on a, uh, you can see the actual trades, teeny tiny volumes here, one stock being traded. Uh, someone's buying one stock, someone's selling th three stocks, someone's selling five stocks. Okay, really, really small volume here. So um, that is perhaps also what we're going down. Perhaps it's simply the lack of volume. Uh, but we can see that here on Tesla, tiny volume. Can you see that, guys? It's always one share, one share up, one share down. down. So um, you can make this market at the moment if you buy 10 shares, I would say. Uh, defensive Stock Channel is up on the Discord. Philco, fantastic. Uh, you, uh, thank you very much for all your, uh, your support there on, on, on managing our Discord. Um, that's a great idea. Dan uh, Nycroft and Eddie Murphy love orange juice stocks. <laughs> that's Christopher. Yeah, okay, thank you very much for C, uh, Z3.ai. Okay. Thanks very much for throwing that out there. I will have a look at uh, that. So C3 dot AI. Okay, pretty unusual to have a dot in a ticker symbol, isn't it? But here it is. Um, we need to go in a little bit closer uh, and we need to get some candles so we can see what is going on here. Um, let me move this back in. So what's going on here really? Uh, we started a life uh, for C3 uh, at around, um, what was it? We started here at $100, basically, right? And now we are sitting at 78. That's a nice 22% sell-off. Um, I mean, before looking at any indicator here, I can tell you momentum is negative. Uh, and, and you can just look at that chart and you just see the amount of sell-off. Uh, we, we have support here at this line, $77. That's the gray Fibonacci line here. We are slightly above that. We tested it a couple of days ago, um, and then we went back again. Uh, we tested it not quite today, but we're getting there. So that is basically our support line. Be below that, there isn't isn't uh, much. Well, there's obviously something, but the chart isn't showing it yet. Uh, let's look at Williams R here, and, and you are exactly where you know you'd expect it to be. You get a sell sell off signal on the 12th of February which quite frankly was a little bit late, uh, but it was better than, than, than never. And then we are now down below this, this, this sort of thick, thick dotted line here. And that is, uh, you know, that whole area down here is the oversold territory. So that gives you some hope that when you go into oversold, you might recover out of it. But at the moment, we're living in that area. So uh, I, I don't see any particular buy momentum indicators here. Um, I don't know the valuation when they're listed, to be honest with you, uh, but it does seem that the uh, uh, listing price was perhaps a little bit ambitious. Um, what else can we see from this? We can see volume yeah, fizzling out a little bit. Uh, although yesterday when we had a positive day, volume was a little bit higher, uh, but uh, that is not holding today. Um, though down 3% for this stock is probably not too bad. Uh, given uh, the, the the massive amount of, of sell-off we had here. But yeah, you can see, basically, I would say $77 uh, might well hold. If it doesn't, uh, the stock is in trouble. That's sort of my, my take on that. Um, I don't see PLTR rallying, says S. Confucius. Well, okay, you if you just joined us, um, I am not talking about today. I'm talking about after this bond yield uh, kind of sell-off. Uh, and where is our Palantir here? Uh, what I'm basically talking about is a little bit more longer term for Palantir. I think the evaluation is starting to look, well, it is actually looking really rather appealing uh, from my point of view. Um, okay, let me move this up. Let me close, close this uh, uh, and we reset the price scale. Uh, sometimes these charts, I don't know if you guys use TradingView, it, it is, it is uh, fantastic in many ways, but sometimes you have to fight with it. You have to sort of labor around it. Uh, so, you know, we've got some really good support here at 2250, basically, where I put in these two purple lines. We also have support lines above that, 23, 24, 20 or so. Uh, and at the moment, we are laboring around 2480. Uh, and we are basically moving between these, these lines I put in here fairly sideways. Um, now, if you look a little bit further back in time, and that's kind of, from a chart point of view, one of the things that has me excited is that we are basically moving at exactly the same 
you know, we are moving at this area here before the rally and we are now uh, moving at that same rally here, uh, that same area. So we are building some really, really solid support here. Um, and if I look at the actual valuations of the company, and I did do that earlier, guys, I, it's open on our uh, um, Patreon. If you want to get your hands on the, on the XLS file, uh, you can see that here. This is my discounted cash flow model, uh, which has me at 83.50 fair value. Uh, if I take my revenue numbers up to where most analysts have it, which is around 12 billion going forward, um, that's one zero too many. That gets me to about $100 or so. And I actually have some years in here which are looking a little bit unappealing uh, where I drop my, my earnings, um, my profit margin essentially down to 6% for no particular reason. I just sort of threw it in there to sort of balance out uh, my, my, my growth op optimism. Uh, I, I think there is a lot of, there are a lot of legs on this. I like the company. I just simply like uh, dig, big data processing. I think uh, there is a huge amount of value that the software adds. And for me, that's pretty much the only software I can think of that makes a company money. Most software costs a company money and you have to buy it. It's just something you have to do. Uh, but this is actually a product that makes you money. And I, I was throwing out some examples earlier about retail, etc. Uh, you know, for example, like I'm saying, you know, this shop where I buy this boy, buy the shirt, they have my data, they know what I bought, they know how often I bought it, and they know my size. Uh, do they ever message me and say, you know, we have this shirt in that si size, but in a slightly different color, here's a picture of it, you want it, click yes, uh, you, you will chat your credit card automatically and will deliver it to you, no, they don't. And if you link that up to their inventory, for example, say they had an overstock of inventory in my size or in someone else's size, say they have, you know, in a large size, they have lots of that and they know they're not going to shift it, rather than going and putting it on sale, they could message specifically those customers in that size and say, hey guys, uh, I've got that shirt you bought here, look, in these three colors, they're fantastic, I'll give you 5% off or something, you, you know, get it today, I'll give you free free shipping or something like that, we deliver it to you today. Uh, do you think they also would sell more than getting sending an SMS message or an email once a year saying Christmas sale on, you know? Of course they would sell more. And that's a really simplified example because it's a simple business retail essentially, but if you look at much more complex businesses with thousands of moving parts, AI and big data processing just makes you money. Uh, and, and, you know, in, in the retail world we live in, no one uses the data. Even Amazon doesn't use the data, really. I think on the e-commerce platform, the recommendations aren't particularly great. I don't know if you have a Kindle, for example. Great product. Does it recommend books that are appropriate? Not that often. It often recommends books that I've already read and purchased through Amazon. So data usage, I think, is a huge growth opportunity for all companies. Uh, and if you automate it, and then you can target specific segments of your clients, the most profitable ones, or you know the stuff you have too much inventory of, for example. You can shift that. Uh, you can be really, really targeted at what you're doing. Or if you, you know, they've just entered the automotive industry, in ICE cars, something like 10,000 parts from hundreds of suppliers. They all have to arrive just in time, and there are people managing this. Absolute nightmare. Uh, AI and, and big data processing would obviously benefit hugely on that. So that's, sorry guys, that's my PLTR rant here. Uh, I, I did advertise it on, 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 the, on the chat, so it is, it is a very, very fair question. Thank you much for uh, uh, making me do that. Uh, re recap there. Um, Luke Wang is going through the roof. Uh, absolutely. Uh, that is recovering quite nicely. Uh, Cassie, I joined the Patreon page. Uh, sorry for the dumb question, but is it the same as a Discord? Uh, Cassie, so if you join the Patreon, uh, you get a an email from Patreon, uh, which gives you the link to the Discord. If you haven't got that yet, Gassi, uh, uh, message me on the Patreon uh, and I'll do it manually. Sometimes if you do use different emails for your PayPal and your Discord or something, it doesn't hook up. Uh, just send me a message over there and I'll, I'll, I'll fix that for you, Gassi. Uh, we'll get you on that. Um, uh, Jasmine Alpha is saying my portfolio is totally flat for the day. Diversification working. Um, yes, I, I, hope, I hope it doesn't stay flat forever. But you know, I think it is a good. It's good to balance things out a little bit uh, to have a bit of, of of exposure to different sectors. I think that's kind of the lessons these mini corrections are, are teaching us here. Uh, and Philco is encouraging you to share your defensive plays in the Discord. Uh, fantastic. Thank you. Uh, awesome for you guys to share things. It makes us all smarter. I like to see people's suggestions. And of course, I throw my own out there as well. Uh, Mihai is asking for Neo. Okay, we can look at Neo gladly. Um, okay, I've, what, what, what happened to Neo? Are we on the Neo chart? Why isn't it's, it's hidden everything? That's the weirdest thing ever. 
Literally all of our imitations. Oh, sorry, we're in one minute mode. <laughs> I'm losing the plot here, guys. Uh, too many bond yields going up. I'm just going to hide that for a second to make this a little bit uh, bigger. So uh, what we were saying yesterday was that I was expecting us to move in this kind of um, purplish uh, area, not that particular box, but the kind of area essentially between 41 and $46. That's sort of where I see us uh, treading water a little bit. Uh, today, we're actually right bang in the middle of that, which is nice to see. Um, not a lot of volatility. Yes, we are down a bit, uh, but uh, not a huge amount of volatility here. And a lot of that's got to do with Tesla being down 3.7%. So actually, the Chinese EVs today are doing better than Tesla. Now, from a momentum play point of view, Let's turn on our moving average lines here in the background. And you can see there in the background, the, the red and the blue line are the moving average line. The red one's 20 days, the blue one's five days. When the blue one crosses through the red line, we get a buy signal. We were hoping to get that today, but we are not. Um, all it would take basically is a couple of percentage points up and we would definitely be there. At the moment they're moving in parallel. Uh, which is not what we want to see, but you know there we are. So it doesn't give us a buy signal yet. If we look at um, Williams R here, uh, we did get a buy signal on the uh, 10th or 11th, end of the 10th of, of March here, basically, uh, at the end of that day. Um, and now we are momentum-wise, we are moving sideways, but we haven't sold off yet. If we sell, if we get a sell signal, uh, that would be basically crossing this red line here. Let me just make that a bit bigger for you. So, you know, when you cross that red line, which is the minus 50 point on the Williams R uh, indicator here, that's the buy or sell signal. We're not there quite there yet. So at the moment, we're moving sideways. And I think that's basically what, what, what this is showing. Uh, and I think uh, most of our indicators are basically going to agree with that. Uh, so MACD here is... Uh, still uh, in a positive territory, but the volume is fairly flat here. Uh, so uh, Neo basically moving sideways, absolutely nothing wrong with that. Uh, I, I actually don't mind it going down 2%. And you, you might be thinking, what? Uh, why would Neo want to go down 2%? Well, we, we just want to build our support. And that's kind of what we do. Um, you know, look, look at this chart here, actually. Remember the CCIV chart? It looks fairly similar, right? A little bit more dramatic. But, uh, you know, we are building... Um, we are building, sorry, the Palantir chart, I meant, you know, we, we are building um, resistance lines here. We did that in uh, before the rally. You know, we did this, we zigzag up and down, and that is what builds uh, at these levels. Every time we hit a low, it builds support. And now we're doing that here. We did that this, we did that, and now we're here. Um, and so here we build some serious support. Uh, and actually along the way, we also do, uh, and, you know, we build some more support here, for example. So actually it's helpful to zigzag a little bit. Of course, I hope it moves in a positive direction. I think it will in the long run, but, you know, it is just one of those days when uh, markets open with the bond yields like this. Let's have a quick look at where they're sitting right now. They're sitting at 1.73, up 5%. We were up nearly 6% when we opened here this morning. So, um, how much importance do you put on a TA for Palantir, says Jonathan Chi there. Uh, look, I think Pella, uh, I think technical analysis is useful for all stocks. Um, I think it predicts kind of human emotion and predicts the psychology of traders. And I think it does it very well. I think it gives you a lot of uh, input into when you can enter a stock, when you want to exit it. I think it gives you support levels, which is useful. It also keeps me sane. I must say, if I'm if I hold something and it's selling off, I can sort of think, ah, okay, but I think it's gonna it's gonna get find its footing here. And if it doesn't, it's gonna go here. It's gonna go here. It gives me some some visibility. Um, it doesn't know. Um, event stuff. It doesn't read the newspapers, basically, right? It doesn't know that. It's dumb from that perspective. So if there's something massive happening in the world, uh, Palantir gets a deal with, you know, to power, I don't know what, Amazon, um, you know, then then that it wouldn't know that. Uh, so it doesn't predict those kind of events, but it is, I think, still a highly uh, useful uh, piece or a uh, tool uh, for, for all stocks, to be quite, quite, quite honest with you, I like to compare, combine it, um, you know, the actual chart and the actual support lines with some of the indicators here. You can see some of the ones that, that I use the most up here. Uh, and I'm very happy to explain those. I've done the first video on sort of basic TA, TA uh, over and I put that on, on our Patreon. If you are interested in that, it's uh, it's on here somewhere. Here it is. Uh, that one taking lesson lesson one candle support lines volume. I did that, uh, and it got it got a, got an eighteen plus rating by YouTube. So there's apparently something uh, very seedy in that video. So you might want to check that out. Um, 
so yeah, I, I think it's a it's a good question. I I think it's it's to me it's a fundamental part of of my investing process. Uh, I do buy things very much for the long run. So you could think perhaps it makes less of a of a difference there. But I think uh, if you are interested in the market and you are interested in in, in sort of the momentum of things, um, I, I feel it teaches me stuff every day. I, I sort of think ah okay that's how that worked. Maybe that's going to be I can apply that the next time I look at another chart. So um, uh, thank you very much, uh, Jonathan, for that question there. Um, uh, Gary, okay, you've just posting stuff on our defensive uh, Discord list. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, your new nickname is 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 BB King. Absolutely, Phil. You're gonna have to rename. Can you analyze Tesla as well? And why does Neo and Tesla move similarly? Uh, Bishes, absolutely gladly. We can do that. I think that's a question a lot of people have. So if we just uh, hide for a second here the annotations and just throw uh, Tesla into the mix on the same percentage scale. You can see, let me just hide these movers, average lines. The orange line in the background is Tesla and you can see it's it's basically the same thing, right? Not always, but it is it is largely. You can see Neo outperformed Tesla since last summer, very substantially, sort of fourfold. Uh, but in the long run, you know, you you, you can see that here. Well, uh, Neo is a, a, a newer beast. It rallied faster. But yeah, huge, huge correlation between the two. Why? Tesla makes the market. I think that's that's the short answer. That Tesla essentially invented the EV market uh, as we know it, uh, and therefore it, it has the power. It's the biggest player. It is in China also. It's the biggest player in China from an EV point of view. Uh, so it, it just matters. Uh, and Neo's valuation rests largely, not largely, but quite significantly on 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 um, Tesla. The last lowering of a price target we saw for for Neo. Uh, you know what the analyst reasoning was? He said it's because Tesla's valuation has come down, their price has come down. That was the only answer. You sort of think, so your fundamental analysis was that it's similar to a competitor, basically. And, and yes, that's that's got a lot to do with it. That's how people are looking at this. Um, so we can have a quick look at, uh, at Tesla um, itself. Uh, let me put my uh, lines back on. So uh, what's going on with Tesla? Well, I'm painting where I don't want to be painting. I wanted to pull this up a little bit. Um, let me get rid of some of my lines here, otherwise you literally can't see uh, the stock. So uh, we've got support lines and resistance lines in here. So uh, we've fallen below the 684.53. Our next support line in here is at about 669. And then there's stronger support at 654. And you know we obviously don't, don't need to go that low. Um, uh, we are at the moment trading kind of in the middle of the sphere. So we are moving sideways. That's how I would look at it. Um, and if you're wondering, uh, you know, why are we where we are, for example? So how do we come up with this line here, which is uh, at, at the moment the most uh, pertinent, the most important rather, uh, uh, support line 669. Uh, let me magnify that for you guys. That's the red line here. How do you get to that? Can, can you see here where my, my mouse is? We almost touched that line. On this day here, the opening price was around 669. And then we go back further a bit over here again on that candle, the low point was 669 and, and so on. So you can build uh, your support uh, very much on the basis of highs and lows. That's a very, very uh, basic way and, and, and easy and, and, and logical way of looking at it. If we look at momentum here, we got a nice buy signal for on the 10th of March, which was here. Um, and we are still <clears throat> in upward momentum, flattening off a little bit, but not significantly. So it's still looking positive. It isn't giving us a sell. Uh, and, and yes, 3.5% down isn't great, but it isn't it isn't down, you know, 8% or something. It isn't a sustained sell-off at present. And at the moment, our low is higher than yesterday's low, right? So uh, that is is also a positive. We also look at higher lows, and that's part of a sort of growth story. Even though you can close the day a little bit lower, if your low, your ultimate low, the bottom of that candle is higher than the previous day, you're still sort of positively consolidating. Uh, you can also see here, very much in the background, it's a little hard to see, but you see that red line there and the blue line in the background, they're crossed. That was also a buy signal where my little green arrow is here. That was a buy signal. Uh, now, that obviously hasn't catapulted the stock up much today, but that's not nothing to do with either Tesla. That's uh, everything to do with, with this here, with 10-year bond yields up being up 5%. So um, I think the, um, the indicators are looking still positive here. Moving average gave us also a buy signal a day later. The positive momentum is a little bit less uh, than it was in the previous day. Uh, so that's a little bit, you know, watch out for that sort of sort of thing. Uh, let's just look at volume here. 
Um, yesterday actually was a good day. It was a green day and volume was higher. And so today, if the vo if we do end up in the closing in the negative, basically you are hoping for low volume um, because then it is a sustained sell-off, I, I, I would say. So um, yeah, my, my take on, on Tesla at the moment is similar to NEO. I think we are moving sideways a little bit. Uh, and that is simply uh, this, this kind of overhyped concern, I think, about bond yields increasing a little bit. And 5% sounds a lot, but quite frankly, a, a, a bond yield of 1.7 isn't really very high in the long run. I think it's going to go higher. I think it might break through two, uh, and that will hurt the tech sector. And, and it, it's a shopping opportunity. That's the way I look at it. And I think then it's going to fizzle out again uh, towards the end of the year. So uh, we'll see where that what happens there. Um, uh, as Confucius, I know you're bullish on NEO. Do you think Leo and XPeng will follow the rally back up? Uh, yes, I think they will. I think the, the three are very highly correlated. And actually, uh, Li and XPeng are having a better day today than, uh, than, than NEO is. So yes, I, I think they will. Uh, I think they will move a sort of in tandem. Let me find NEO down here, town point 8%, uh, where uh, Li is only down a fraction here, 0 0.18, and XPeng also half a percent down. So yes, I do think they move together. Uh, have you ever looked at, at uh, pins or crowd? Uh, what do you think about them right now? Not in great detail. I think it's something I, I, I would like to look at more. I'll make a note, um, because thanks for the, for the suggestion. Um, I, it is on my list, but it's sort of been moving down my list. I'll look at that again. Thanks, Jonathan. So stick around. Uh, and appreciate your questions also. Thank you. Um, uh, high PE stocks, there's to sell off. Max B says there. So yeah, I think the technicals there don't actually help you that much. Uh, I think it's it's almost more to do with just if bond yields go up, uh, those companies that are valued on forward income um, and are high growth stocks, um, that inflation that where people are concerned about uh, gets deducted from the future income to bring us back to present value. That's not the greatest explanation. I posted an article on there yesterday, I think, on our Discord, which uh, basically explains that a little bit more more eloquently. Uh, but that's basically what's happening. So that, that'll continue to happen, basically, um, as long as bond yields go up. Um, is Powell speaking again later, later again, Leonardo? Uh, welcome to the chat, Leonardo. He is giving a speech, but on something completely unrelated. Uh, there is a, a Fed uh, calendar here, Federal Reserve calendar. It's loading. Here we go. Let me just scroll. Not the fastest website in the world, is it? Here we go. Uh, on the 18th, so today he's watching, he's talking at the Bank for International Settlement Committee on Payment and Market Infrastructure Conference. Doesn't sound terribly exciting, does he? And obviously he isn't speaking yet. Uh, but yeah, so that he's going to talk about that. If you are really interested to hear what he says, you could watch that. But I think uh, I would save myself the hour. Um, but yeah, yeah, he might say the occasional sentence. I think we're sort of back to the good old days of Greenspan or something where people are always listening to every single word he utters. You know, when he orders a bagel or something, people are like, but how did he say it? How did he pay? You know, did he have a $20 note or a $10 note? You know, that sort of thing. So people are getting a little bit obsessed again with this. That's just the market we're in at the moment. I think it's going to last for, for, for quite some weeks. So um, chip shortage will be capping expectations for growth in, in NVIDIA, et cetera, is just enough. Yes, somewhat. Uh, though in a way, you would think semiconductor stocks would benefit from that. Uh, they are not at present, right? Look at the semiconductors here. Uh, the whole thing is down except for a couple of small ones. ASX, AMKR, uh, nothing. None of the major ones. Uh, one of the Chinese ones, is it S? Is it SEM? L is it S? I can never remember the ticker. They're building a huge factory in Chen in, in, in Shenzhen uh, together with the uh, Shenzhen government there. So they're funding that, and that's just you're seeing uh, both U.S. and Chinese governments ramping up expenditure there. I'm hoping that something positive will come out of that meeting in Alaska. Uh, probably not, but just the fact that they're talking, I think, is is probably uh, beneficial. Uh, guys, I'm gonna have to wrap it up here. It is late at night in Hong Kong. I really love all you guys who hit that subscribe button. Thank you for building this community. It's an absolute pleasure. I do the content for you, so what you want to talk about, let me know. Uh, and I really enjoy these these Q and A's as well. If you want to continue Q and A's, uh, come and join us on the Discord. You can do that from the Patreon link below guys uh, and then you can continue chatting with me in the community so um, thank you very much for tuning in guys it's a wrap here from hong kong have a lovely successful trading day let's hope we repeat yesterday's story where things actually turned green but at the moment we're looking a little bit reddish here so thanks guys it's a wrap